Good morning. I am Jenna Winters from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Parks and Watercraft. Welcome to Winter Bird Feeding Tips and Tricks. Um, with us today is naturalist Mandy Walski from Cowan Lake, and we are given supports today by naturalist Kaylin Callender from Lake Hope. She'll be uh, helping to answer questions. And also naturalist Lauren Stewart from Mommy Bay. So um, feel free to utilize the uh, question and answer pane. Um, these ladies will be here to um, try to find some answers for you and we will ask Mandy questions. So ask away. And uh, next next webinar up next week will be um, on the American Beaver. So put that on your calendars. That should be really interesting. So Mandy, take it away. Tell us about winter birds. So I really want to talk today about the birds that you would see in your backyard, why they come to your yard, um, and then we're going to really dig deep into what you should be feeding and supplying to get different species to come to your yard. So I have a slideshow if um, you can follow along and then we're going to do some fun stuff with actual seeds themselves. So do we see the slideshow? Not quite yet, but it, it usually takes a second. You need to put it in presentation view, Mandy. Oh, got it. And that do it? You should have it, yep. Mandy. Yeah. All right, so what what I want to talk about first is um, why we why some of us feed birds. So for me, um, it's because I really love to, to to be in nature and having something that I can do at home even on like a crappy day and I could just sit and look out the window, I have that. Um, as something that I can use for entertainment and for viewing wildlife. And then another thing that I hear often is people like to feed the birds because they're afraid the birds are having trouble finding food in Ohio's harsher weather conditions. Um, so to bring birds to your yard, most people understand they need food. Um, so we put out our feeders, right? We, we put out feeders, we put in a seed mix. Um, but one thing a lot of people don't do is provide a water source. Um, so we have things like bird baths, you could have a little pond in your yard. Um, and so for water, there's there's a lot of different options. During the winter, uh, my, my aunt actually has a heated water dish that is designed for dogs but she doesn't have any dogs. She sets it out there underneath the bird feeders all winter long so that the birds can, can get water that is not frozen. And then another important thing is shelter. So you wanna make sure that you have somewhere for these birds to go. They you know, like to perch in trees and hide in the shrubs and putting up a birdhouse always brings them in because a lot of times they're looking for a place to hide from predators. Um, even something as simple as a stick pile uh, is perfect for most birds. So when we talk about feeding the birds, there is a uh, reason that there are so many different seeds when you, when you go to buy a bag of bird food. The reason behind it starts a long time ago. Um, so Darwin, when he did his ex explorations on the ship, the Beagle, he ended up at the Galapagos Islands. And while he was there, um, he came across all these different species. He brought them back and an ornithologist looked at them. Um, John Gold looked at them and determined that they were all ground dwelling finches, but they all looked so different. So if you look at this, and you guys can answer in the comments if you like, if you look at this picture, what is the big difference you see in these birds? The biggest thing that you notice? So 
So one of the first things that pops out to me is bird number one has this huge beak and then bird number three right below him has this tiny little beak and um, you know there's some in between. Some are longer, some are fatter, some are you know take up the majority of the face, some are hard to see from far away. So if you look at these different bird beaks, do you think they all eat the same food? That is uh, that is a um, what we're looking at today is yes, they're all finches, but if we only put out one certain food, are they really going to all come to eat if all we put out is black oil sunflower seed? So what's when you're deciding um, what you want to feed, there are some things that you want to consider. So not all birds eat the same thing. Sometimes it's not, you know, their favorite food or because they actually cannot physically eat it. So if you tried to give this little tiny bird with a little tiny beak a big peanut, that probably would not work. So I'm going to um, stop presenting. Can you guys see me again? Wonderful. So we're going to look at some of these adaptations and look at some of the things that birds do. So we have, you saw those finches, they had those big beaks. Here in Ohio, we have cardinals and blue jays. And this pliers are kind of a representative of that. These big, huge beaks, they're not going to eat this tiny, tiny little seed here. That beak just isn't made to do that. So what these big cardinals and blue jays are looking for is more of a seed. So with the cardinal, they do love black oil sunflower seeds here, and they use their big beaks to break open the sunflower seed a lot easier than I can. Um, so they break it open and they find the seed on the inside. They're not going to eat that shell. They're going to throw that shell aside, toss it away, and they're just going to eat that meat that's on the inside. If anybody's ever eaten sunflower seeds, you know that you don't eat that black part. Another one that our cardinals really enjoy is safflower. And again, that big beak allows them to break open this harder shell of the safflower and get down into the meat of the um, seed. So blue jays beaks, they, they're big too, but they're, they're strong just like a cardinal so they can break things open, but because of how big they are, they can fit an entire shelled peanut in their mouth and fly off with it. And they carry them away from my feeders. And it's almost comical. They will come over. And blue jays are extremely smart. So they'll come over and they'll pick up the peanut. And they'll give it a little shake. If they drop it, it's because that peanut doesn't have food in it. And they can tell by the weight and probably even the sound. So when they find where they want to go and they decide to eat, that's when that strength, like the cardinal, comes into play. So they're going to snap that and they're going to find, again, the meat of that peanut. And just like sunflower seeds, you know you don't eat the shell. Um, I've seen people do that. I do not recommend it. The inside of this tastes so much better. It is very comical to watch the Blue Jays um, shake the peanuts but they will also take them raw as well as other birds. So our tufted titmouse has a slightly different beak. It is still strong enough to break open things like sunflowers, but it, it's also strong enough to eat this hard peanut. One of the other birds that we have here in Ohio is a Carolina Wren, and this one is a little bit harder to talk about because I am not skilled with chopsticks. So Carolina Wrens have a wide variety of food that they will eat. So their beak is adapted for seed eating, insect eating. Um, so it's, it's strong enough to break open a sunflower seed 
but it's also thin and long enough that if I can do this correctly, it's also long enough that it can get down into bark and pull out little insects. So what I have here are mealworms and I buy these dried. Normally I only put these out in the summer because if they get snow on them, they just get gross really fast. So another cool thing about our Carolina wrens is they have an adaptation of a hooked beak. So what I mean is at the end of their beak, there's this tiny little hook. And we do have a photo coming up that will explain this more. So Carolina wrens will eat seeds, nuts, berries, insects, but they'll also eat amphibians. So when they get a hold of an amphibian, they need to get that meat out. They do have a hook at the end that helps them rip that skin of the animals to get down in there and get to the meat of the amphibian. What else does that remind you of? So at Cowan Lake, we have a uh, housing for raptors and all of our raptors have these strong beaks with sharp points on the end. Again, to be able to really pull apart their dinner, they have a hook. Now their beaks are, are designed not just for helping them eat, but they're to tear apart their food, but they're also designed um, strong so that they can kill their prey as well. So um, our goldfinch is a very, very, very tiny bird, and he has a very thin, long pointed beak and they prefer to eat seeds. So when I put out my feeders, I try to find seeds that um, are specific for them. And with their really long beaks, they're kind of like trying to um, pick up rice, maybe with some tweezers. So the Niger seed or thistle seed is one that I put out for my goldfinch. And the goldfinch beak being long and pointed, they can get into the small holes of the feeder and pull these out seed by seed. Now, I like to watch the goldfinches because their seed is so small, they will sit at the feeder and eat and eat and eat. A lot of our birds are going to come to the feeder, grab their food and take it elsewhere like we talked about with the blue jay. Um, we have some birds that I call, um, I call them hide and seek birds. So what they do is they come in and they grab a, a peanut or they grab a black oil sunflower seed and then they fly off and I have to try to find where they went in the tree with my binoculars to see them actually eat. So I call those hide and seek birds. It's a fun little game that I play with those birds. Um, they will go up, they will come down, they will grab a seed and when they leave, they go up to a tree and they sit down on that tree and they use the tree in their beak to break open that seed. Now, one of the other things they do that is really cool is they will take that seed and they will stick it in the bark of the tree. Come back, grab another seed, go to the tree, stick that seed in the bark, come back, grab another seed, stick that in the bark. And what they're doing is storing food for later. So those small, strong beaks not only help them eat the seed, but it helps them hide the seed as well. So um, beaks are not just there for eating. Um, a lot uh, our the bird beaks are adapted to do more than that. They are strong, as we talked about the raptor's beaks. Um, so they help with, uh, again, killing prey. Um, beaks can also help build their nests. Beaks will also help them preen their feathers, feed their young. I mean, these beaks are really adapted to do a lot of things. 
So one of the other birds I wanted to tell you about today with a really cool beak is one that arrived at Cowan Lake over the summer. And it wasn't the first time we've seen this uh, type of bird at Cowan, but it was really special for our visitors. A pelican, a brown pelican came to visit. So pelicans beaks are specifically adapted for the type of food they eat, just like all our other birds. But they're not going for seeds, they're not going for nuts, they're not gonna come to your feeder, but their beak can hold three gallons of water. I mean, that is pretty amazing. Think about three gallons of milk, how heavy that is, how much fluid that is. Um, and then imagine trying to carry that all in your mouth. Impossible for me to do. I can barely keep a cup of water in my mouth for a long time, but these birds, they'll go down and they will, um, white pelicans will float on the water and uh, stick their mouth down into the water and grab a bunch of water where there are fish um, gathered around and they'll pull the fish into their mouth. And then brown pelicans dive down into the water, slightly different way of hunting, but, or fishing, I guess. So what I have here is some floating. Well, I guess they didn't float. So I'm gonna use these tongs to show you that pelican is gonna get water in its mouth. It's going to then dip its mouth into the water and grab at a school of fish. It filters that water out. Some of it gets swallowed, some of it um, does not. And then once there's no water, they put their head back and they eat all of the fish that they have caught. So this is a fun one to do. Um, you can actually do a lot of these things with just items around your home for the kids to play with and pretend to be birds. This is a new one for me. I, I've never done this one before because I've never had a pelican at the lake since I've been working there. So I was doing this one this year with the kids. I did have stuff that float that float better than this. Um, but that is an example of a difference there with a bird that may eat a slightly different meal. The other one um, that a lot of us know, and it's not winter. Um, so you're not going to see these birds right now, but the nectar of a flower is very important to hummingbirds. So the nectar is in some flowers like our columbine or our um, like great blue lobelia, that nectar is hiding down in the bottom of the flower. Um, we do have some bees that will chew on the base of that flower to get to the nectar and steal it out from down here. But the hummingbird is specially adapted to be able to take their long, thin beak, put it down into the flower and reach that nectar. Let's see. Oh, nectarine flavored. Nectarine. I see some laughs. I love it. So I did that on purpose, nectarine flavored nectar. Those are some really cool adaptations. Um, when you're at McDonald's the next time with the kids, you can be hummingbirds drinking your orange flavor drink at McDonald's. So I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint and talk about some of those specific birds that we have here. These are all from my own feeder. Um, so what we have is a common bird, the white-breasted nuthatch. This bird, you can tell by looking at the beak, it's very sharp. Um, it does eat insects, but this beak is strong enough that it can break through some of those nuts that we talked about, like the black oil sunflower and the safflower seed. I have also seen them take peanuts and seen them eat suet. So the tufted titmouse on the right there is, um, he has like a really small beak. He's able to pinpoint what he wants to grab with that beak. So if there's small insects, little bits of fruit or nut in your seed mixture, he's going to be able to dig through that seed mixture and grab the exact food he wants. 
We did talk about the blue jay beak. Now look at these two beaks compared to each other. That blue jay beak is huge compared to his head, whereas the Carolina wren on the right is a tiny little beak. So the blue jay, like we talked about, he can carry his food away whole. He's strong, he can break food. And the Carolina Wren photo really doesn't have a good, it's not a great quality, so you can't really see the hook at the end of the beak. But this is one of the most versatile um, feeders that I know of here in Ohio. They come to my feeders, they'll eat from the suet, they'll eat from the seeds. I do put those mealworms out for them during um, spring and fall. And I, I mean, really, they they will go on the tree and eat peanut butter off of the bark. There's a lot of different things you can do for these birds. So that brings us to like types of feeders. Um, thistle sock is, um, one that a lot of people will recognize. So this is a pine siskin. It is, it looks a lot like our um, American goldfinch. And this pine siskin's beak, see how sharp and pointed it is? And then look at that sock. So that sock has to hold those tiny little seeds. And the pine siskin can use its beak to go inside those tiny little holes and pull out one seed so that it can eat. Um, the brown-headed cowbird off to the right, I do get a lot of those at my feeder. They go for the larger seeds, but they will also eat a um, dried corn mix. So the pileated woodpecker, now their beaks are especially adapted for the type of food they like to eat, but it's not just the beak for them that helps them eat. They um, have a plate in their head that allows them to protect their brain when they're banging away at a tree. They use that really sturdy beak in their strong necks to poke holes in trees. And then they have a really cool tongue. The tongue is um, sticky, but it also has little barbs on it that when it comes out of the mouth, it goes into the hole it made and stabs insects or the insects stick to their tongue with that uh, gooey substance that's on their tongue. So that's a huge beak compared to the little one next to it. Now this one's a red-breasted okay. nuthatch. We get these typically in winter in Ohio. They will come to a lot of different feeders and they will eat a lot of different things, just like our um, white-breasted nuthatch. They have a shorter beak, but they still manage to break open seeds and eat nuts. So there's our tufted titmouse again. He likes this wire feeder that holds the peanuts. If you're going to do real peanuts, um, it's best to have them in a covered thing. And in this photo, you can't tell, but there is a plastic cover over the top of this feeder. So then we have our ground dwellers. And when the birds, remember I told you they're really picky and sometimes they will dig through the seeds and nuts to find the exact one they want. Well, they don't always, um, they don't always treat that food nicely. And a lot of times if they don't want something, they just throw it on the ground, but that's okay. They're not being wasteful because the little birds on the ground do love to eat too. So we have some foraging birds on the ground. You'll see robins that um, pull worms out of the ground. You'll see sparrows that dig through the grass with their feet and then use their beaks to find what has been discarded by the birds eating at the feeders. And a lot of times there is a lot of mess under the feeders. It's not all junk. It's not all discarded shells. A lot of it is food. And um, just, Mandy, yes. just wanted to, uh, we have some questions. Yes, so go ahead. Wanted to inter interject really quick here. Um, one of our questions um, was, what do crows eat? Oh, crows are, um, they're kind of like, they have a huge diet. So they will come to the 
come to the feeders, they'll eat things that are at the feeders. They'll go after fruit. They'll go, they'll go after the seeds and stuff, but they will also eat from the dead animals on the side of the road. Basically, they like whatever is available to them. Most of the time when I have crows in my yard, they attack the like sturdy feeder. They get up there and they just kind of tear into everything. So it's kind of hard sometimes to see what they're af actually going after, but I have watched them break the peanuts open in my yard and um, dig in there and get the actual peanut out. Uh, most of the time when they're in my yard, though, they're on the road and they're eating from something that was hit by a car. That's a good question because that's not one that normally comes to feeders for this kind of food. Thank you. So if you, um, I'm going to stop here again and close out my um, PowerPoint and I can't figure out how. Uh-oh, Alyssa, I'm not sure, or Jenna, I'm not sure how to close this. I've lost you're, my window. You're fine. All we see right now is you. Yeah, you oh, don't need to close you're good. Okay, so I wanted to talk about wh what seeds to buy. Now, you know those beaks are all different. Um, if you guys want to put in the comments, like if you already watch birds at your house, if you want to put in the comments, like if you know how many species you have, go ahead and tell me. Uh, I'm really interested to know, do you just get like the same one or two species every time? Are you only getting cardinals and blue jays? Are you only seeing the goldfinch? Is it only chickadees and titmice? Um, let me know how many species you have and then we'll talk about some of the different seeds and food options you can add in to get more of the species of birds coming into your feeder. So we did see on my tray that I had a lot of different seed. Um, one of my favorite things to put out in good weather is the full peanuts. So the full peanuts, um, they bring in those bigger birds with those bigger beaks like the blue jays and the crows. Um, and then the other little birds just kind of leave them alone. They don't go to them. Um, another thing that I like to do is put out one of those generic seed mixes. So when I say generic seed mix, what I mean is it's just a bag of bird food that has multiple different types of food in it. So this one actually has black oil sunflower seeds, striped sunflower seeds, some safflower seeds. This has some uh, peanuts without the shell, and there's even some bits of dried fruit in here. I saw one that was a cranberry. Um, so this is a good seed mix for a wide variety of birds. The little white um, circles you see in here and the little red circles are what we call millet. Now millet is not something that most of our birds like. It is one of those things that normally ends up on the ground. Um, it's almost like a filler for this bag, unfortunately. Um, when I see birds, the only birds I really ever see eating this are house sparrows down on the ground or house sparrows on the feeder may eat some of this um, millet as well. So I recommend looking for a bag that doesn't have as much millet. They are a little bit more expensive because this is really filler, but you'll get more bang for your buck if you spend the extra money and not have as much millet. So if you're um, really obsessed like I am with feeding your birds and you really just want to have tons and tons of birds coming to your yard, the more food, different types of foods you put out, the more birds you're gonna see. So I do, like I said, I do buy bags of dried mealworms and I will put dried mealworms out on um, a little plate. I have a feeder that is specifically designed. It looks like a little bowl that hooks to my um, bird feeder to hold mealworms. Um, these will also be, if you have a wide enough area that you have bluebirds, eastern bluebirds in your yard, bluebirds do really love mealworms. 
The other thing you can do, if you would rather see a bunch of cardinals in your yard, you can specifically buy just one kind of seed. So this one is a big bag of safflower. Uh, I do put this out. Um, if, if I see that most of my little birds aren't coming to the feeder and it's mostly cardinals, I will put out a lot of the black oil sunflower seed and then mix in some of the safflower seed so that I'm feeding them what they actually want. Um, another thing that you can do is you can buy peanuts whole or you can buy peanuts that are already shelled. One thing I do want to bring up is that you don't want to go to, to Kroger and go into the snack aisle and buy peanuts that are for human consumption. They have um, a lot of salt added to them for our enjoyment, but it's not necessarily good for the birds. So I do buy in the bag. Um, and then you can also, some stores do sell in bulk. So I typically, the, typically I go to Rural King and I buy in bulk um, some of the other seeds and foods. Um, it's, it's a great way to get a good variety. So I buy in bulk my Niger seed. You can buy socks pre-filled. Those um, nets of, for feeding the goldfinch pre-filled as well. I did mention the corn. There, this is a mix of um, cracked corn, uh, millet, black oil sunflower seed, and I get this because I don't just like to watch the birds. I love to watch the antics of the squirrels. Now, some of the bigger birds with the big strong beak adaptation can eat this corn. Most of the time it gets thrown on the ground, and I also make piles of it around my feeder for the squirrels themselves. Um, not a good idea though if you don't want those squirrels at your feeder because they will tell all of their squirrel friends that there is corn at your house. Then I also I'm buy my black for a oil. second, Mandy. Yes. There, um, just to address some questions. Um, we have, um, sorry, I'm trying to find it here. Um, Larissa wants to know how can I attract species of sparrows like white throated? song and tree sparrows without attracting house sparrows? I hate to say this, but you probably cannot, especially if you're in a rural area. Um, there is an abundance of house sparrows. I have tried many years to get rid of house sparrows, um, including trapping them. Um, so what those sparrows really are looking for, they do like to be undercover and they like to be hidden from predators. So if you have some bushes or the stick piles, I've even seen people build lean-tos near their feeders. So it's, it's almost like a little half tent out of sticks for the birds to, to get underneath and then you spread the seed under it. But those, those white throats, the white crown sparrows, um, the, uh, the ones that you don't normally see sitting on bird feeders, that's because they don't want to be up. They want to be down and hidden from predators and they want to forage on the ground. So my neighbor across the street gets more white-throated sparrows than I do and that's typically where I watch sparrows with my binoculars because he has a huge row of bushes that drop seeds. So a good one would be um, spice bush or um, maybe some of the different viburnums like arrowwood viburnum, um, nanny berry, there's service berry, holly. There's so much thing, so many things that you can plant as food sources for the birds, not just with buying seed, that those birds are going to be more inclined to come visit um, if there is a um, a fresh option that they can hide and eat. So I hope that helped. Thanks, Mandy. Um, tilt your camera up just a tiny little bit. We can just a little bit. Yeah, so we, we can okay. see all of your beautiful face. <laughs> I, was, I was showing seeds. I'm sorry, but I thank you for that. Um, 
so another thing I want to talk about is our woodpeckers. Yes, they will come and they will eat some of these things, but they have a very special need. They like um, to, to dig in for their food and I'll see them come and grab a big peanut or I'll see them grab the peanuts out of the feeder. But I think they actually, I know this probably is not scientifically accurate, but I think they enjoy my feeders more when I give them something to peck at and dig into. And that's what, what I'm talking about is the suet. So suet comes in, you can buy this pre-packaged and it comes in a lot of different flavors. Um, they all have different ingredients uh, and they all seem like they're telling you it's going to attract more birds or different birds. So for instance, this one is a woodpecker blend um, and this one is nuts and berries. And believe it or not, this one is hot pepper. So a lot of different things here. There the hot pepper is one that if you have a squirrel problem, the squirrels are not going to want to eat this, but the birds can't taste it. So this is a good one to try if your squirrels are eating too much of your suet. This is the one that I have the best. Um, it's almost always gone quicker than any of the other ones is this woodpecker uh, blend. I have had um, hairy woodpecker, downy woodpecker, red-bellied woodpecker, and the pileated woodpecker all in my yard eating off of this woodpecker blend. Um, there are others, like this one is cherry. Um, the peanut blend is another one. I think the woodpecker and the peanut blend are pretty similar. So look at those suet packets. Try them in your yard, see which ones um, your your birds are really enjoying. Now the ones with the fruit in it, the Carolina runs do come to it, but they go to the woodpecker blend just as often, I think. Um, there are also some that have, well, this one was blueberry. I just thought that was funny, all these different flavors and birds really can't taste, but um, so this one's a sun, flower blend so it's peanut sunflower um and then just wild bird blend um i'm not sure what exactly the difference is in all of these i say figure out which one works for you but if they're not eating it within a if it gets yucky you should definitely throw it away if they're not eating it i would not suggest trying that one again another cool thing about birds is that they won't, this suet is, is pre-made. It's not gross to put out. It, it's a little, you know, icky, oily, sticky on your hands, but it's not really gross, gross. I do go to my local butcher and suet is basically like a chunk of fat that is coming off of an animal that's been processed for us to eat. And the butcher does sell, um, just like you would get your hamburger in a little package, butchers do sell suet in a little package. I would recommend if you are going to go that route, especially if you have crows that like to eat, that's a good one for them. I can't believe I didn't think about that with the crow question. Um, only use that when it's really cold. So today there's a lot of sun out. It's um, it's nice and warm and that suet. I mean, imagine if you left your hamburger sitting outside right now in the heat, I, that would be pretty gross. So you don't want to use that that suet from the butcher for that. I wait and get the suet when we've had a lot of snow the suet will stay good for longer. And um, most of the time it gets eaten um, when the birds are trying to get all that nutrients to keep themselves warm, to have the extra calories to be able to burn off. So um, because my screen is locked and all I can see is, I'm not seeing what you guys are seeing. I do want to talk about the feeders themselves. As somebody who feeds birds, it is your responsibility as the bird feeder to clean up after them. They can't get that 
they can't get out a mop. They can't get out the, you know, the hot water and the scrub brush. Um, but they rely on you to make sure that they are safe at your feeders. Um, so I would suggest at least four times a year, at the minimum four times a year, end of every season or beginning of every season is a good time to do this. Empty the bird feeders, really scrub them out um, and make sure they're clean and dry. And if you do use bleach or any other chemicals to clean them, just please make sure they're rinsed really well. Um, a lot of diseases come with can come with bird poop um, and they can spread eye infections to each other. And then if you're putting out water as well, make sure that water is clean. Don't let that bird bath become green and slippery and slimy. Make sure that's clean. Replace that water at least once a week. If you have any feeders that break, you know, those squirrels, and raccoons sometimes too. They knock my feeders down on the ground and they break. And um, if a bird comes in fast and catches its wing on a broken piece of plastic that it just didn't see, that's really bad for the bird. So replace anything that breaks. And if you notice that above your feeder is a place where they always sit and then they are constantly dropping their feces on top of your feeder, you might have to clean a little more often. You don't want to leave large amount of feces um, at your feeders for an extended period of time. I have <laughs> had lots of questions before about what do you do with the mess? under your bird feeder. Um, I have some pretty funny, <laughs> I have seen a video of a woman who once a week took her vacuum cleaner outside and sucked up all of the crumbs from the birds to keep them out of the grass. And she would do this like right before her husband mowed. Absolutely not necessary. The grass underneath your feeders after a long time may end up dying. I do know a lot of people who will plant a flower bed underneath it to feed hummingbirds with. So there's a lot of options. You do not have to drag that vacuum cleaner outside to suck up all the seeds and stuff. Rakes work really well um, or putting down a layer of uh, dried leaves would work too. Um, and sometimes they do grow underneath your feeder. You may end up with a small sunflower or a lot of weeds from from some of the thistle seed or other seed. So make sure you are cleaning really well. And um, I guess I I think that's about all I have. Um, for for this. If there are questions, I would love to answer, but I also have, um, I don't know if Caitlin could pull up the PowerPoint and get to the, the rest of the slides um, because my, my screen is, is locked, but there are um, a couple links that we would like to share with you. I think your gonna... slide shows up there. Oh, it is. Wonderful. Well, so um, now that everybody's seen it, I didn't realize it was showing. So um, if you have your kids with you, I, I don't know if they've already seen this image, but I am going to uncover it. I want to show how bad sometimes the, the disease can be to the eyes, so I'm going to do that now. And unfortunately, this, this has happened in my yard. So this is an eye infection that is really typical amongst house uh, finches, and they do spread it really fast. When this happened in my yard and I noticed that there was um, an infected bird, I immediately took down all of my feeders. I did a 10% bleach solution, rinsed them really well, and then left them down um, for about a week so that the finches would kind of spread out and not be um, back on my feeders. And then about three weeks later, I did the bleach again, just because I was worried about my feathered friends. Um, so as a wrap up, remember that you want to offer shelter, offer a variety of seeds, 
Uh, here you can see this is actually my front yard and one of my setups for a feeder, one of my setups for a feeder. I did say one because I have multiple. You want to offer areas where they can rest, whether it's a rock pile, a stick pile, or underneath those bushes is perfect. They can rest there and they can shelter there. And then here is um, just don't forget water. So this is a pretty simple setup that I use. And all this is is a big plastic bowl. And I fill it with the water and I tilt it on its side so that the water comes to the edge. And then because it's plastic, it really under hot water with a scrub, it just wipes off. It's very simple. I also have a cheap trick for you. If you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart, they sell these big planters for, you know, decoration outside of your home for big, big like, um, to make a big thing of flowers. But underneath that planter, there's this plastic dish that collects water. That is perfect. Those things are so cheap. Get, you can get one of those, keep water in it, bring it in. And you know what? Mine actually fits in my dishwasher. So just another option. You don't have to spend 200 bucks on a big fancy bird, feed, bird um, bath when you can just do something like this. So the, I know we've been answering questions, but are there any more at this time that um, we need to get through from the question section? Uh, let me take a look. Uh, Lauren and Kaylin have been really busy and we've had some really good questions so far. Good. Um, I, I think you'll, you'll expect this one because I, I, I like you. I like watching the squirrels, but some people don't. So what suggestions do you have for keeping squirrels away from bird feeders? I, away from the bird feeders, I know there's a couple tricks. Um, I've never tried them myself. I have heard that people will set up another station with things like um, the dried ears of corn, the um, corn mix I was talking about, maybe even um, like some old bread, and they will put it on another section of their property. So if my feeders are in front of my main window and I just want the birds to be there, I can offer the squirrels something else on the other side of my yard and in hopes that they will stay away from the really good stuff, like that black oil sunflower seed and the safflower. Um, other things that you can try, they do make what is called a baffle. Um, and it is, uh, a way so the squirrels can sometimes come up your feeder. They are very limber. They crawl right up the um, post and that's how they get to the feeder. So a baffle goes over the post and then when the squirrels come up, they have no way to get around it. And those come in a, lot, a wide variety of sizes and shapes. Some are even designed to not just keep squirrels out, but also raccoons. Another thing that is very important to remember is that squirrels jump and they jump very well. They have really strong hind legs that allow them to move through the trees. And if your feeders are close enough to your house or to your trees, they can they will jump from a branch or from your roof um, onto the feeders. And sometimes it's quite comical. They don't always make it. They fall off. They try again. But having an open space where they can't jump down to is uh, probably one of the best things that I have seen work. All right, thank you. Um, we have a question from Angela. How do you keep water out during the cold without heated dishes? So if you have a small pond, a lot of times um, the ponds that I, like the one that's in my yard, it does have a motor that runs um, year round. And as that water is being circulated, it doesn't always freeze. So that is one option. Another option is to, I'm sorry. Oh, OK, so another option is when you want to watch the birds, you put the water out right then. And then when it freezes, you get rid of the big ice cube. And um, that's really for people who are like if it's a Saturday, 
and it's really cold outside, I will I will do that. I I I admit I'm a little crazy when it comes to watching my birds out my window. I'll have my coffee. I'll go out. I'll feed the I'll fill the feeders and I'll put out fresh water and then come inside and enjoy my coffee and watch the birds. So a cup. My aunt is just like I am. This is probably where I got my crazy bird obsession, but. Um, the dog, the dog bowl that she has is, I mean, it works really well all winter long, um, and, but she's lazier than I am. So I supply the fresh water if there's a lot of birds out there. Mandy, oh. kind of continuing with that, uh, Lisa has a question about in the summertime with your water dishes, how do you keep the water clean without attracting those breeding mosquitoes? So those mosquitoes are one, they do not like moving, moving water. So if you have um, a bird bath that has like a little fountain and it's moving, those are a little bit more expensive. The mosquitoes aren't going to lay eggs in there. Um, frequently changing the water uh, is probably your best bet. And then you also want to remember that you don't need a lot of water for those birds. I mean, these birds are really tiny. If you only have like a quarter inch of water in there, that is enough for birds, bees, butterflies. Um, and the mosquitoes may not want to, uh, they may be looking for bigger water areas that I have had mosquitoes lay in five gallon buckets in my yard. So the, the best thing I can tell you is to constantly change the water at least once a week. Um, and the same with cleaning during the summer, it's really important to clean those, those water dishes because the heat from the sun helps things grow in that bird feeder. And you, that's the time of year that you'll get that green scummy feel to it. So the more cleaning and the more changing of water, the less chance you'll have of mosquitoes. That's a good question. OK, Mandy, we got one more question and then we're going to end it for today. Um, OK, Liam would like to know how fast does the bird's eye disease spread? I honestly do not know how fast it spreads. I know that when I had it in my yard, it was during um, the great back. Um, no, it was during Project Feeder Watch that I noticed it. And Project Feeder Watch is a citizen science program where you report the birds you see in your yard. And that's why I noticed it because I was constantly watching and counting and looking. And I did see one bird that I was like, what is wrong? I just thought that maybe he had gotten into a fight with another bird over territory or food and had lost an eye. And then um, a few days later, I realized I had two birds missing eyes and I was like, OK, that's weird. And I had actually made a note of that in my book. I, I don't know if it was like a week later or two weeks later, but when I started to see that um, like four or five of the birds almost look completely blind in both eyes, I did some I did a search online and that's how I actually learned about this. Contacted a couple of my birding friends and they told me what to do. So within a couple weeks of watching my feeder, it, it went from like one to, to four. So four, five, six, I'd have to go back and look at my notes. It was a few years ago. So it was really quick. Now, does that mean that it happened that fast? I'm not totally sure. I don't know where those birds were living. I don't know if maybe my neighbors have feeders out. Maybe they were over there and I just didn't see them. Maybe that feeder got empty, so they came to mine. There's a lot of different um, reasons that I saw more or less, but the best the best thing you can do if you notice it um, is to to clean right away. Um, and if you if you're like me and you're you're watching, you'll probably notice it quick. It, it was very obvious to me that something was wrong with that bird. That's a really good question. Now I've got to go do some more research. All right. Thank you so much, Mandy. We really appreciate your time today. 
Um, thank you to everyone watching. We had some great questions and it's always um, just really exciting to us to see how excited you all are um, about your birds because obviously as a bunch of naturalists, we are really into birds and, and love watching them. So thank you for joining us um, again next week. Um, join us at the same time for a webinar on the American Beaver.